Good morning, everybody. We are here to start chapter five in the Hunger Games this morning. Um, we left off with Peta and Katniss just about to arrive at the capital. Um, and Katniss is really trying to size up her competition. Even though they are from the same district, um, they are competing against one another in the Hunger Games. There's only one winner. Um, and unfortunately, that means that everyone else is going to die. Um, so Katniss is really trying to figure out, can she trust PETA? Should she trust PETA? And how should she um, kind of take on this whole situation? All right, chapter five. Rip. I grip my teeth as Venna. A woman with aqua ha hair and gold tattoos above her eyebrows yanks a strip of fabric from my leg, tearing out the hair beneath it. Sorry, she pipes in her silly capital accent. You're just so hairy. Why do these people speak in such a high pitch? Why do their jaws barely open when they talk? Why do the ends of their sentences go up as if they're asking a question? Odd vowels, clipped words, and always a hiss on the letter S. No wonder it's impossible not to mimic them. Venna makes what's supposed to be a sympathetic face. Good news, though. This is the last one. Ready? I get a grip on the edge of the table I'm seated on and nod. The final swath of my leg hair is uprooted in a painful jerk. I've been in the remake center for more than three hours and I still haven't met my stylist. Apparently, he has no interest in seeing me until Venna and the other members of my prep team have addressed some obvious problems. This has included scrubbing down my body with a gritty foam that has removed not only dirt, but at least three layers of skin, turning my nails into uniform shapes and, and primarily ridding my body of, of hair. My legs, arms, torso, underarms, and parts of my eyebrows have been, stripped up, have been stripped of the stuff, leaving me like a plucked bird, ready for roasting. I don't like it. My skin feels sore and tingling and intensely vulnerable, but I have kept my side of the bargain with Hamish, and no objection has crossed my lips. You're doing very well, some guy named F Flavius. He gives his orange corkscrew locks a shake and applies a fresh coat of purple lipstick to his mouth. If there's one thing we can't stand, it's a whiner. Grease her down. Venna and Octavia, a plump woman whose entire body has been dyed a pale shade of pea green, rub me down with a lotion that first stings but then soothes my raw skin. Then they pull me from the table, removing the thin robe I've been allowed to wear off and on. I stand there completely naked as the, three of, as the three of them circle me, wielding tweezers to remove any last bits of hair. I know I should be embarrassed, but they're so unlike people that I've, I'm so more self-conscious than if a, tr a trio of odd-colored birds were pecking around my feet. The three step back and admire their work. Excellent. You almost look like a human being now, says Flavius, and they all laugh. I force my lips up into a smile to show how grateful I am. Thank you, I say sweetly. We don't have much cause to look nice in District 12. This wins them over completely. Of course you don't, you poor darling, says Octavia, clasping her hands together in distress for me. But don't worry, says Venna. By the time Cinna is through with you, you're going to be absolutely gorgeous. We promise. You know, now that we've gotten rid of all that hair and filth, you're not horrible to look at, says Flavius encouragingly. Let's call Cinna. They dart out of the room. It's hard to hate my prep team. They're such total idiots. And yet, in an odd way, I know they're sincerely trying to help me. I look at the cold white walls and floors and resist the impulse to retrieve my robe. But then Cinna, my stylist, will surely make me remove it one at once. Instead, my hands go to my hairdo, the one area of my body my prep team had, had been told to leave alone. My fingers stroke the silky braid my mother so carefully arranged. My mother. I left her blue dress and shoes on the floor of my train car, never thinking about reti retrieving them. Of trying to hold on to a piece of her of home, now I wish I had. The door opens and a young man who must be Cinna enters. I'm taken aback by how normal he looks. Most of the stylists they interview on television are so dyed, stenciled, and surgically altered, they're grotesque. But Cinna's close-cropped hair appears to be its natural shade of brown. He's in a simple black shirt and pants. The only concession of self-alteration seems to be metallic gold eyeliner that has been applied with the light hand. It brings out the flecks of gold in his green eyes. 
and despite my disgust with the capital and their hideous fashions, I can't help thinking how attractive it looks. Hello, Katniss. I'm Cinna, your stylist, he says, in a quiet voice somewhat lacking in the capital's affections. Hello, I venture cautiously. Just give me a moment, all right, he asks. He walks around my naked body, not touching me, but taking in every inch of it with his eyes. I resist the impulse to cross my arms over my chest. Who did your hair? My mother, I say. It's beautiful. Classic, really. In almost perfect balance with your profile. She has very clever fingers, he says. I had expected someone flamboyant, someone older, trying desperately to look young, someone who viewed me as a piece of meat to be prepared for a platter. Cinna has met none of those expectations. You're new, aren't you? I don't think I've seen you before, I say. Most of the stylists are familiar. Contestants are familiar constants in the ever-changing pool of tributes. Some have been around my whole life. Yes, this is my first year in the game, says Cinna. So they gave you District 12, I say. Newcomers generally end up with us, the least desirable district. I asked for District 12, he says without further explanation. Why don't you put on your robe and we'll have a chat. Pulling on my robe, I follow him through a door into a sitting room. Two red couches face over a low table. Three walls are blank and the fourth is entirely glass, providing a window to the city. I can see by the light that it must be around noon although the sunny sky has turned overcast. Cinna invites me to sit on one of the couches and takes his place across from me. He presses a button on the side of the table. The top splits and from below rises a second tabletop that holds our lunch. Chicken and chunks of orange cooked in a creamy sauce laid on a bed of pearly white grain. Tiny green peas and onions, rolled shaped like flowers, and for dessert, a pudding the color of honey. I try to imagine assembling this meal myself back home. Chickens are too expensive, but I could make do with a wild turkey. I'd need to shoot a second turkey to trade for an orange. Goat's milk would have to substitute for cream. We can grow peas in the garden. I'd have to get wild onions from the woods. I don't recognize the grain. Our own tesserae rations cook down to an unattractive brown mush. Fancy rolls would mean another trade with the baker, perhaps the, for two or three squirrels. As for the pudding, I can't even guess what's in it. Days of hunting and gathering for this one meal, and even then it would be a poor substitution for the capital version. What must it be like, I wonder, to live in a world where food appears at the press of a button? How would I spend the hours I now commit to combining the, combing the woods for substance, substance, if it were so easy to come by? What do they do all day, these people in the capital, besides decorating their bodies and waiting around for a new shipment of tributes to roll in and die for their entertainment? I look up and find Sinna's eyes trained on mine. How desp despicable we must seem to you, he says. Has he seen this in my face or somehow read my thoughts? He's right, though. The whole rotten lot of them are, desp are despicable. No matter, says Sinna. So, Katniss, about your costume for the opening ceremonies. My partner Portia is the stylist for your fellow tribute, P Pita, and our current thought is to dress you in complimentary costumes says Cinna. As you know, it's customary to reflect the flavor of the district. For the opening ceremonies, you're supposed to wear something that suggests your district's principal industry. District 11, agriculture. District 4, fishing. District 3, factories. This means that coming from District 12, Peta and I will be in some kind of coal miners getup. Since the baggy miners' jumpsuit are not particularly becoming, our tributes usually end up in a skimpy outfit and hats with headlamps. One year, our tributes were stark naked and covered in black powder to represent coal dust. It's always dreadful and does nothing to win favor with the crowd. I prepare myself for the worst. So, I'll be in a coal miner outfit? I ask, hoping it won't be indecent. Not exactly. You see, Porsche and I think that coal miner thing's very overdone, so no one will remember you in that. And we both see it as our job to make the District 12 tributes unforgettable, says Cinna. So rather than focus on the coal mining itself, we're going to focus on the coal, says Cinna. Covered in black dust, I think. And what do we do with coal? We burn it, says Cinna. You're not afraid of fire, are you, Katniss? He sees my expression and grins. A few hours later, I am dressed in what will either be the most sensational or the deadliest costume in the opening ceremonies. I'm in a simple black unitard that covers me from ankle to neck. 
shining leather boots lace up to my knees but it's the flattering cape made of streams of orange yellow and red and the matching headpiece that define this costume cinna plans to light them on fire just before our chariot rolls into the streets it's not real flame of course just a little synthetic fire portia and i came up with you're perfectly safe he says but i'm not convinced I won't be per perfectly barbecued by the time we reach the city center. My face is relatively clear of makeup, just a bit of highlighter here and there. My hair has been brushed out and then braided down my back in my usual style. I want the audience to recognize you when, when you're in the arena, says Sinner dreamily. Katniss, the girl who is on fire. It crosses my mind that Sinna's calm and normal demeanor masks a complete madman. Despite this morning's re revelation about Peta's character, I'm actually relieved that he shows up dressed in an identical costume. He should know about fire, being a baker's son and all. His stylist, Portia, and her team accompany him, and everyone is absolutely giddy with excitement over what a splash will make. Except Sinna. He just seems a bit weary as he accepts congratulations. We're whisked down to the bottom level of the remake center, which is essentially a gigantic stable that the opening ceremonies are about to start. Pairs of tributes are about they're being loaded into chariots pulled by teams of four horses. Ours are coal black. The animals are so well trained. No one even needs to guide their reins. Cinna and Portia direct us into the chariot and carefully arrange our body positions, the drape of our capes before moving off to consult with each other. What do you think, I whispered to Peta, about the fire? I'll rip off your cape if you'll rip off mine, he says through gritted teeth. Deal, I say. Maybe if we can get get them off soon enough, we'll avoid the worst burns. It's bad, though. They'll throw us into the arena no matter what condition we're in. I know we promised Hamish we'd do exactly what they say, but I don't think he considered this angle. Where is Hamish anyway? Isn't he supposed to protect us from this sort of thing, says Peta? With all that alcohol in him, he's probably not advisable to have him around in open flame, I say. And suddenly we're both laughing. I guess we're both so nervous about the games and, and more pressingly petrified of being turned into human torches, we're not acting sensibly. The opening music begins. It's easy to hear blasted around the capital. Massive doors slid open, revealing the crowd-lined streets. The ride lasts about 20 minutes and ends at the city circle where they will welcome us, play the anthem, and escort us into the training center, which will be our home in prison until the games begin. The, di the tributes from District 1 ride out in a chariot pulled by snow-white horses. They look so beautiful, spray-painted silver, and tasteful tunics gathering, glittering with jewels. District 1 makes luxury items for the capital. You can hear the roar of the crowd. They are always favorites. District 2 gets into position to follow them. In no time at all, we are approaching the door, and I can see that between the overcast sky and evening hour, the light is, star the light is turning gray. The, dis the tributes from District 11 are just rolling out when Cinna appears with a lighted torch. Here we go, then, he says, and before we can react, he sets our capes on fire. I gasp, waiting for the heat, but there is only a faint, tickling sensation. Cinna climbs up before us and ignites our headdresses. He lets out a sigh of relief. It works. Then he gently tucks a hand under my chin. Remember, heads high. Smiles. They're going to love you. Cinna jumps off the chariot and has one last idea. He shouts something up at us, but the music drowns him out. He shouts again and gestures. What's he saying? I ask Peta for the first time. I look at him, realizing that, ablaze with the fake flames, he is dazzling. And I must be, too. I think he said for us to hold hands, says Peta. He grabs my right hand in his left, and we look to Cinna for confirmation. He nods and gives us a thumbs up, and that's the last thing I see before we enter the city. The crowd's initial alarm at our appearance quickly changes to cheers and shouts of District 12. Every head is turned our way, pulling the focus from the three chariots ahead of us. At first, I'm frozen, but then I catch sight of us on a large television screen, and I'm floored by how breathtaking we look. In the deepening twilight, the firelight illuminates our faces. We seem to be leaving a trail of fire off the flowing capes. Cinna was right about the minimal makeup. We both look more attractive but utterly, utterly recognizable. Remember, heads high, smiles, they're going to love you. I hear Cinna's voice in my head. I lift my chin a bit higher. 
but on my most winning smile and wave with my free hand. I'm glad now I have Peter to clutch for balance. He is so steady, solid as a rock. As I gain confidence, I actually blow a few kisses to the crowd. The people of the capital are going nuts, showering us with flowers, shouting our names, our first names, which they have bothered to, f which they have bothered to find on the program. The pounding music, the cheers, the admiration work their way into my blood, and I can't suppress my excitement. Cinna has given me a great advantage. No one will forget me. Not my look, not my name, Katniss, the girl who was on fire. For the first time, I feel a flicker of hope rising up in me. Surely there must be one sponsor willing to take me on. And with a little extra help, some food, the right weapon, why should I count myself out of the games? Someone throws me a red rose. I catch it, give it a delicate sniff, and blow a kiss back in the general direction of the, the giver. A hundred hands reach out to catch my kiss, as if it were a real, tangible thing. Katniss, Katniss, I hear my name being called from all sides. Everyone wants my kisses. It's not until we enter the city circle that I realize I must have completely stopped the circulation in Peta's hand. That's how tightly I've been holding it. I look down at our linked fingers as I loosen my grasp, but he regains his grip on mine. No, don't let go of me, he says. The firelight flickers off his blue eyes. Please, I might fall out of this thing. Okay, I say. So I keep holding on, but I can't help feeling strange about the way Cinna has linked us together. It's not really fair to present us as a team and then lock us into an arena to kill each other. The twelve chariots fill the loop of the city circle. On the buildings that surround the circle, every window is packed with the most prestigious citizens of the capital. Our horses pull our chariot right up to the President Snow's mansion, and we come to a halt. The music ends with a flourish. The President, a small, thin man with paper white hair, gives the official welcome from a balcony above us. It's a, it's, it is tradition to cut away the faces of the tributes during the speech, but I, I can see on the screen that we are getting way more than, than our share of airtime. The darker it becomes, the more difficult it is to take your eyes off our flickering. When the national anthem plays, they do make an effort to do a quick cut around to each pair of tributes, but the camera holds on District 12 Chariot as it parades around the circle one final time and appears in the training center. The doors have only just shut behind us when we're engulfed by the prep teams. We are nearly unintelligible as they all babble out praise. Who are nearly unintelligible as they all babble out praise. As I glance around, I notice a lot of their tributes are shooting us dirty looks, which confirms what I've suspected. We've literally outshone them all. Then Cinna and Portia are there, helping us down from the chariot, carefully removing our flaming capes and headdresses. Portia extinguishes them with some kind of spray from a canister. I realize I'm still glued to Pita and force my stiff fingers to open. We both massage our hands. Thanks for keeping hold of me. I was getting a little shaky there, says Pita. It didn't show, I tell him. I'm, I'm sure no one noticed. I'm sure they didn't notice anything but you. You should wear flames more often, he says. They suit you. And then he gives me a smile that seems so genuinely sweet, with just the right touch of shyness that an unexpected warmth rushes through me. A warning bell goes off in my head. Don't be so stupid. Pita is planning how to kill you, I remind myself. He's luring you in to make you easy prey. The more likable he is, the more deadly he is. But because two can play at that game, I stay, I stand on tiptoe and kiss his cheek right on his bruise. Okay, so that's the end of chapter five. Um, they had quite the entrance um, and gathered quite the attention, not only from the citizens in the capital, but also from the other tributes. So there's um, the other 11 districts may have not been so happy with them. Um, all right, so we will continue with chapter six tomorrow. I hope you're enjoying the book. Let me know what you think down below in the comments. Bye guys.